So, uh, welcome everyone to yet another episode of the Daily Medieval Podcast, and then we have yet another uh, amazing interview with um, one, uh, well, incredible person, really. My next guest today is uh, one I've really been looking forward to, uh, from sailing all around the world to becoming a maritime historian, a marine historian, um, and archaeologist in Egypt, aiding the preservation of shipwrecks and promoting education. Alicia Johnson is here with us today and she has one of the most incredible stories. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, well, now I feel like I'm going to let down all your guests <laughs> with that type of introduction. Well, let's let's try our best to see how we can do here. Uh, Thank I'm, you so I'm much trying my best for the introductions. I'm, I'm, I've said it before. I'm a good hype. I'm a good hype man. I was going to say, you're a great hype man. We need you with some contest <laughs> over here. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. So, I mean, I'd love to start at the beginning, I guess, by just saying, I guess, where did your pursuit of history begin? Well, you know, I have always been interested in history. I honestly don't think I can really remember a time in which I wasn't enthralled with history. I think as, as a young child, the history channel was most certainly mm. something that really interested me. And if you're a little bit older, you remember before the ancient aliens, before everything <laughs> yeah. went downhill. You know, yeah. like the history channel used to be really good. And I used to just watch everything. And I read every book I could find. And as it was, I was born in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is America's oldest seaport. So we had the rich whaling history, the fishing history. I mean, I'm from Boston and we got real angry at the English and threw some tea <laughs> overboard. So, you know, I come from a cultural background that appreciates history. And also my, my grandmother really pushed going to museums and, and reading literature. So in general, I had family members that pushed my interest of history while also providing me with the locations to to learn more. And also, you know, I'm a little bit of a nerd when I was younger. <laughs> I, did, I didn't really have a lot of friends, but you know what I did have was a library card and I made all the friends in my books. I love it. I love it. So how did you go then from watching these TV shows to now being in Egypt, going on shipwrecks and preserving archaeology, doing all this stuff? Well, I went to uh, I went to uh, undergraduate at College of Charleston, and uh, to be honest, one of the big spurs for me, and this is a little bit of a trigger, but um, I saw Barack Obama speak when he was running for president in uh, was that back wow. in two thousand and eight? Yeah, he yeah. came to College of Charleston. I mean, I, 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 of course, I voted for him. I've mm. always been a progressive person, but around that time in the South, you know, they're not so uh, they're not so progressive, and I remember seeing people hanging black dolls from trees oh and just gosh. really just not being excited about what was gosh. happening so yeah. i i finished college and uh, you know i mean the 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 cultural uh, lashback that we're still continuing to see in america really didn't ring well with me mm. and at the time i decided i wanted to travel my goal uh after graduating was i wanted to travel and by the age of 30 I wanted to be back in graduate school. So that's exactly what I did. I ended up actually purchasing a sailboat after Hurricane, what's the one that hit her, uh, Jersey? Sandy. That's right. Hurricane Sandy smashed through Jersey. So I got a discounted sailboat, which was great. Yeah, it was, yeah. You want a good boat? Yeah, yeah. For, wait for a hurricane. Mind, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good, a good discount, Barley. So my ex and I, we bought the boat, restored the boat, and we wow. sailed away. <laughs> I don't think anybody really believed me when I was like, no, guys, I'm going to leave. Yeah, but yeah. at the time, uh, as I said earlier, I'm a little bit of a nerd. I've always been a computer nerd. So when we started sailing, it turns out that the majority of the sailing community are all over 45, 50 years old. And you know what those people all need? They need someone to help them open their PDFs <laughs> and set up their Facebook for their business. So that's what I did. When I was sailing, I would go port to port to port to port. And I would meet all the business owners and I would be the one that established their social media, got them on TripAdvisor, got them on Google. So this was a really great skill set that I had because I had a lot of friends who were older than me in sailing with us. But at the same time, none of them had the computer literacy. So I used to make decent money, even though I had a very low cost of living because I was in places like the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. and the Bahamas where you don't really need to spend a lot of money if you have your entire house with you. Like yeah. I was a big moving snail. So I traveled for many years 
as cheaply as possible while doing computer work. And eventually I got down to the US Virgin Islands and the British Virgin Islands. And I wound up with a job being a social media manager for a high-end yacht charter company. And at the same time, I'm a pretty decent chef. So I ended up running luxury yachts for a couple of years. So I was working in that. And then I got into scuba diving because they told me they would pay me more money if I could give guides underwater. <laughs> and that's how I did it. I was like, you'll pay me more? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll put that nice. tank on. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So I flash forward about two, two and a half years into my, my yachting career, Hurricane uh, Irma came through and uh, she, she smashed up the entire Caribbean. <laughs> And then, like, nine days later, it's like, oh, you have hope? Here's Hurricane Maria. So oh. I did, yeah, I didn't know boats could fly, but they yeah. actually can, yeah. turns out. And the entire islands were decimated, unfortunately. Mm. But after that, I ended up working a season in what I'd like to call the Mad Max apocalypse. It was very enjoyable. Had a great time. Managing a boat with a hole in it. <laughs> but we did it. We did it. So I ended up actually leaving the Caribbean after that because it was it was a lot. There was a high levels of alcoholism, high levels of like of community crimes. The U.S. Virgin Islands has one of the highest murder rates in America. Wow. Chicago gets that gets that all the time, yeah. but no, no, it's the Virgin Islands. Let me tell you, they got a lot of guns, a lot of guns, a lot of cocaine. Yeah. So I ended up leaving that career in that business, and I decided I wanted to go back into academia. So it took me about a year of handling paperwork with the Egyptian government, which let me tell you, their bureaucracy is quite intense. <laughs> so I, I ended up going to the, uh, where was I? I, went, I had to go to the United Nations office in New York City to have paperwork ratified. And uh, I accidentally walked through their uh, security with a, with a dive knife in my pocket. Oh, that didn't, that didn't go over so well. They're no, like, what I are you imagine. doing? Oh, no, 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 I forgot. Sorry, oh. man. I'm always in the water. So it's not for you guys. I promise. So I ended up uh, filing all my paperwork. It would take about a year to process. So in that time, I moved over to the Philippines and I started getting more and more into my underwater photography. And I lived in the Philippines and, and really just went all over that country. And I fell in love with the wrecks there as well in Baswanga Bay because they were the World War II wrecks. And I found the history of uh, the Japanese military invasion and occupation of the Philippines just to be a fascinating topic in, in history because I'm an avid World War II buff. So add in the South Pacific and then add in some shipwrecks and you have me about sold. So I lived over there for a bit, went to Indonesia, lived over there for a little while and dove with Manta Dive in the Geelys. And then at that point in time, my paperwork was processed and I began the trip to Egypt <laughs> where Very I would be nice. greeted with much anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. What I find, I guess, most interesting about that is obviously that, I guess you you there's there's a quite a large gap between, like, learning about history and then and then practicing history. I mean, do you think that, given if in the event that the two hurricanes that hit didn't happen, I mean, do you think your life would be in a very different place? May you, would you have maybe not even gone into history, perhaps? No, no, because I, I didn't mention, but at the time, the captain was very abusive to me. So the, oh, uh, okay. the hurricanes really just spurred that to get oh, me on. Oh, fair out. enough. That's fair. You know, I'd, I'd like to hope I still would have gotten out of yeah. there. So that's, uh, that's still amazing. I still would like to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's still the amazing The hurricanes how... just pushed me to get out. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. So, I mean, what particularly, I mean, you, now... I understand you have a degree in classics. Uh, yes, I have a, let's see here. I have an AB and a BA mm. in history and a BA in classics. And I minored in Latin and Jewish studies in wow. undergraduate. Wow. Yeah, I was, I was really dedicated. Yeah. But then of course, then you say about kind of World War II. So, I mean, what particular part of history are you kind of drawn more towards? I mean, is there a particular part with your kind of career that, also that you kind of lean towards as well i mean in general i just the story of mankind i find mm. it to be the world's most interesting soap opera so i guess i'm very interested in personal connections mm. in politics 
And unsurprisingly, 20th century World War II, you have kind of this, the rise of authoritarianism and the yeah. cult of personalities. And also, if you look back in antiquities, you also have similar similar people along these lines with the Roman leaders, whether or not mm. I wouldn't necessarily call them quite dictators to the extent you see in the 20th century, but you definitely have some uh, charismatic folks such as Julius Caesar that come in and really shake things up. Mm. So I am, I guess I would say I'm drawn to politics in general. And I like to study that from kind of a larger holistic point of view. Mm. So mm. if you're studying modern European politics, it's pretty good idea to have an understanding of the concept of the Athenian democracy. So for me, everything just kind of builds on each other. Yeah. And being able to have the background allows me to better understand and to learn more about these topics. Mm. So I guess that would be my interest in general as people. Yeah. I mean, so how does this then, I guess, coincide with the archaeology? Because Egypt is obviously, it's, it's um, you know, a place that's been around since the Romans. Of course, you have then Cairo, which was kind of medieval. And then, you know, it, so... <laughs> it's, it's been like 7,000 years we've been... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, it's, it. it's been there a while. Um, <laughs> so with your kind of job and your archaeology... Is there a particular part of history that you t that you typically have to investigate or I mean, do you then end up with shipwrecks or sites, archaeological sites that are thousands of years old, but then also 20 years old kind of thing? Actually, that's the cool thing about my my ongoing research at the moment for my master's mm. that I'm finishing. I'm looking at three different case studies for different shipwrecks. Okay. And as you said, they all come from different eras. I have a Roman era wreck that's going back to Augustus. I have an Ottoman era wreck that goes back to 1765 common era. And then I have my favorite one, the Thistlegorm, <laughs> which dates back to 1941. So I'm looking at three different examples through different uh, eras of history. Okay. So that's kind of the aspect I like about uh, maritime archaeology is that you can look at the development of mankind on the water. So mm. that's uh, I like to look at really anything I can get a hold of. I find it all to be fascinating. Yeah. So what is your um, master's um, research about then? Because, I mean, how are you connecting then these, these three case studies? Well, I'm looking, so as I have a background in tourism, because yeah. I used to run the dots, I look at how can academia be used in a perf purposeful manner that actually benefits the general public? Because mm. a lot of the time, our publications don't get read by anybody. Yes. Nobody reads them. <laughs> yeah. I, I know, I, I always laugh when academics get so high and tidy. I'm like, did anyone read it? Yeah. No? Did it actually help anyone? No? Okay, <laughs> I'm glad you feel great though. So I'm looking at quantifying the tourism benefit of preserving historical shipwrecks because the Thistlegorm is statistically rated as Paddy's number one dive site that's a wreck in the world. Wow. Yeah. And on average, yeah. it brings into Egypt about 5 million euro each year. Mm. And in a country like Egypt, where the average income is about 170 US dollars a month, 5 million euro into the economy is a huge amount of money. Yeah. So if these sites are protected and preserved and promoted, mm. it brings in the chance of bringing in high value tourists because in general, scuba divers tend to have um, some level of disposable income. They tend to bring in a lot of money into these areas. They stimulate hotels, restaurants, boats, dive shops, engineers on the boats, people mm. building the boats. In general, I'm looking at the economic ramifications of preserving these sites. And what are the risks that are actively against these sites? So I guess I, although I definitely respect people who publish work that is much more scientifically based and might not be mm. as accessible to the public, I think that there's um, a strong use in collaborating with the public to help them better understand and appreciate what's already there. Because you can go on social media right now and type in like hashtag shipwreck, and you're going to see the thistle gorm. You will see a lot of these wrecks are trending on social media because wrecks are cool. They are yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. and they take great photos underwater. And social media, I, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like a show me world. Mm. So if I could show you something cool, I can probably inspire you to go visit it. Yeah. Because, yeah. for example, one of the reasons I went to the Philippines, I wanted to see a whale shark. <laughs> yeah. I traveled across the world to ethically see a whale shark. That was mm. why I went. I was like, I am on a quest for a whale shark. So if someone like me 
can go to a different country halfway across the world because they want to see an animal ethically. Mm. There are mm. people that will definitely travel around the world to go see cool shipwrecks. Yeah, and seeing as, yeah, Egypt ranks as the number two diving in the world only after Indonesia. Mm. And furthermore, another very famous aspect of Indonesian diving is the, uh, the Liberty Wreck. It's another World War II wreck. Yeah, and that yeah. dive site alone stimulates about, I believe I read, there are 53 resorts and dive shops in the nearby vicinity that are wow, supported wow. because of that wreck. Not to mention mm. all of the dive shops from the south that come up to the wreck for a day dive as well. Yeah. So it's important to preserve these wrecks because they are monuments to our past. Many of them are cemeteries, they're graves. They need mm. to be respected just for that matter. It's a time capsule, a moment in history, because wrecks usually go down quite quickly. Mm. It's not, it's, mm. You don't necessarily always have a Titanic issue that takes a couple of hours <laughs> and it's dramatic. Sometimes it's two minutes. So yeah. when a ship sinks like that, everything is stuck. And mm. it's, it's a beautiful way to look into our past. But you also have the risk of other people looting these sites, people yeah. stealing things. Also, some another aspect that people don't really know about, but I learned about, is after the detonation of the atomic bomb, okay. the, the steel quality in the world diminished. Oh, really? So oh, wow. all of the wrecks prior to the detonation of the atomic bomb have a higher quality. So oh, in places yeah. like Indonesia and the Philippines, where there's a lot of World War II wrecks, yeah. there's a risk yeah. of illegal salvaging because the materials are worth a lot of money. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so sometimes the rectus disappears, yeah. but at the same time, a lot of them have oil and chemicals and, and big problems inside. So there's a reason like they, not only mm. do they need to be preserved and excavated, but we should probably make sure there's not a terrible oil leak that's going course, to happen. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I mean, I personally, um, I used to live in Thailand for about five years and we used to do a lot of diving, one of which was a World War II uh, shipwreck called the Hard Deep. Ah, Absol yeah, see? It was absolutely amazing. And it is one of those things that, someone who whether you are into history or not i mean it's just amazing to be able to go in and see these things it's a lot different to i would say kind of on land archaeology which uh, is is can be a bit more <laughs> digging a hole in the field but um it's I, what i find the most amazing then is is about this kind of preservation because i remember as well visiting the site that there was certain things that you, obviously you kind of can't do i mean pre preserving a uh, Roman wreck and a World War II wreck surely would be there's very different processes involved yes yes and How, of course yeah there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in a lot of this as well that's in 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 Egypt that's usually the the biggest deterrent is the ability to get permits and funding for these sites and also yeah. there's a lot of security risks in yeah. Egypt. So no, they're, they're worried. They're worried. Like, no, no, don't touch it. Mm -hmm. So for example, in situ preservation is usually the go-to method. And okay. that's basically when you create an anoxic environment by putting a bunch of sand on top of everything. So oh, yeah. it's a really, really financially savvy <laughs> choice. And basically the reasoning is we'll, we'll, we'll get to this when we get some money. So this is usually because excavation underwater costs a lot of money yeah, for example yeah, yeah. the the mary rose I'm, I'm unsure if you're familiar with that but i believe the entire the entire excavation and raising it in the museum mm. it was about 75 million dollars oh yeah, yeah right now imagine how much a now imagine how much a couple of bags of sand cost yeah so, i can see so the 2001 unesco convention on mm. underwater cultural heritage basically is a proponent for saying in situ preservation is the best first approach because mm. it helps you to create an anoxic environment and oxygen is one of the biggest reasons to deteriorate some of these wrecks. So if you can kind of encapsulate it, you can apply for funding, you can get the grant permits, you can work with the government and that's basically the best way to kind of move forward. But every different site has its own risks and mm. different project plan management that needs to be enacted. So every site is is unique in what yeah, what is yeah. the best approach and uh, there's been many sites that maybe the preservation wasn't carried out as best as it could have been i mean jacques cousteau was a pioneer in underwater in underwater everything and he uh well you know he probably took the bell off the thistle gorm and you know he probably took a whole, whole lot of other things i yeah. think i watched a documentary and watched him jump off of a scuba scooter onto a turtle 
never seen a man ride a turtle but oh, wow look at him go so when you look at the the past historical pr uh, practices of archaeology we're still in kind of our infantile stage okay. of ensuring that we are using the correct methods and also scientific advancements are allowing for a lot more uh, research mm. to be done such as advancements in dendrochronology in which you can take a sample from a wooden wreck and you can be able to figure out what is this what is this boat made of what type of tree is this where did the tree come from was there a drought where the tree came from so you can get all of this really cool information about these wrecks with uh, with a uh, um, technology progressing and at this point in time one of the one of the aspects of preservation that i find to be most interesting says i love underwater photography is um, photogrammetry mm. and that's the concept of taking thousands of photos of a site and layering on them on top of each other and say a program like Metashape and creating a 3D model. Oh, wow. And it, yeah, what's so useful about the 3D models is that it makes these sites accessible to people who otherwise might not be able to get there. Uh, so awesome. creating a, uh, creating these models for the Thistlegorm, the Dunraven, a couple of these other sites, it, it, it helps people to be able to visualize the wreck and you can really like you can zoom in and you can see the details it's mm. and also if you're a researcher and say you just forgot what hold number four looks like <laughs> you can go and you can look yeah and you can zoom into exactly the spot you want to see and you're like ah oh, you're right that is where the live ammunition is mm. Mashallah. <laughs> no that's brilliant i mean so one of the things that i i, I find that, I mean, that's pr pretty amazing about all the technology involved, because obviously with the, uh, some of the archaeology uh, that I've done, it's a lot of it, the, the revolution seems to have come with things like metal detecting and stuff. But so what does the kind of the, the tool belt of a marine archaeologist look like? Because for me, it's a trowel and like a gardening knee pad. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. And, and a brush. Um, but I can imagine it's much different for <laughs> well i got my scuba tank that's really effective. <laughs> I like that i like being able to breathe underwater i'd say so so for the sites that i've been on now mind you maritime archaeology can be above the surface as well because it relates oh. to humans interaction with the waterways so there are plenty of wrecks that are up on land you know of course, that it might, yeah of course might just be the uh, the skeleton of the hull you know mm. what i mean so it's not limited to just being underwater so you might still find a maritime archaeologist that has the same exact tools that you would mm. have but I, i'll never forget one of my professors demonstrating the uh, the best uh, archaeological method of clearing sand underwater <laughs> of course, yeah. like yes yes create a wave yeah. underwater so you have a lot of times in which you're 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 not exactly touching something to be mm. able to get a look at it you're using you're using the underwater environment as your benefit to be able to get a better look so for me my my main equipment at this point is my underwater camera mm by scuba diving equipment often we have scales i'm sure i'm sure you're familiar with a scale very effective way to be able to show people how big is this yep. item <laughs> so that's 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 what we're working with also like research vessels are very important they're very mm. expensive but we have uh, um, methods of being able to kind of suck up some of the sand although the problem is that that can be damaging to sites yeah. and sometimes you see sites that it, they've been a little too proactive and cause caused problems because of this mm. so a lot of the times i feel doing the underwater archaeology is evaluating a site before you start to excavate it and then of course you've got like lifts water balloon lifts in which you use air an air pocket inside of a bag to float an item ah, yeah. so yeah there's a lot of tricky methods to yeah. work underwater and also <laughs> If you it depending on the site determines what type of equipment you need to dive with. Mm. If you're going on a forty a thirty eight to thirty eight plus meter dive, yeah, you need to be getting, even if it's even if it's not that deep. If you're diving regularly, you need to be using nitrox. Otherwise, you're going to have be otherwise you're going to be getting the bends and not feeling yeah. so great after doing thirty dives at, at a deep <laughs> dive. If you're if you're going deeper than that, you need technical technical diving. You need a rebreather. You need to air circuits and whatnot. You need to if you need to be down deeper, you need to have the training to do this. And technical diving is that's my next my next uh, hmm. certification I'm going for is to be able to do I believe what what is it like sixty five meters and like that. Oh, that wow. awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm like that'd be awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm into it. I'm into it. I love it. 
Um, yeah. So before, I guess, moving on to kind of more of the education side, just a final thing on the actual sites themselves. Um, I guess, how recent is too recent? Because I remember so, a lot of things about, for instance, as you say, that so a lot of these are graveyards. Um, so in terms of the preservation with a shipwreck, yeah. yeah. It's okay. So UNESCO defines it as a hundred years makes it underwater cultural heritage. Oh, really? But I don't, I don't necessarily find that to be a great date because mm. World War II is a hugely influential event in of our course. history and it wasn't a hundred years ago. So a lot of these sites don't have the protection of the UNESCO convention because of the limitations mm. of the date. But that being said, you have other sites, I believe, forgive me if I missed it, if I mistake it, but I believe it's called the, the Sadana Express or the mm. Salem Express. And this is, this, this is a terrible story. It was a boat that had about six, six, I think it was 600 passengers on it coming over from Saudi Arabia and it sank and it killed a lot of people. And this was back not that long ago, maybe 20 years ago. Okay. And they all died terribly. Friends who mm. dove the site to retrieve the bodies. So, and it's still a very sore spot in the people's hearts because so yeah. many people died. But you know what? They're making a dive site out of it and people going on it all the time because really? it's known really? as being a, oh yeah, yeah, because it's known as being a great dive. I haven't dove it because for yeah. me, I find that to be a little ethically um questionable. <laughs> quite, exactly. I but <laughs> but so you have people who are more than happy to go dive these sites that don't necessarily have the same notion of venerating the dead that I do. Yeah. But it, it's hard to decide when is something, when is it no longer so heart-wrenching that we can discuss this. But at mm. the same time, a, a wreck such as the Thistlegorm, even though that's about, about, about 80 years old, there are family members still alive. So the research and learning about their stories helps the family members to yeah. connect with their with their dead relatives and to be able to see the the sacrifice that their family members gave in the name of the uh, of the british resistance against the nazis mm -hmm. so it's 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 a difficult question to say when is how how long do you need something to ha to have passed yeah. before it's able to be addressed it's, I would say it's very subjective based on yeah. what happened. I mean, I'm sure you know uh, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald in one of the Great Lakes in America. There, if I'm not mistaken, there are still bodies on that wreck, oh, I believe, wow. because yeah. the, I don't, I do not believe the families wanted them removed. So they don't let divers, and now I just really deep. So like, I'm going to have special d diving to get down there, yeah. but yeah. it's, most certainly considered a cemetery and a grave. So uh, I I would say I think it largely determines it's determined by the family's sentiments mm. and also the the circumstances in which the wreck sank. Right, oh, brilliant. So I guess the culmination of all this is that you're a big participant in kind of educational programs, and I know, for instance, you're part of the Maritime Archaeology Outreach Program. Um, I mean, could you say a bit about some of the kind of things that you kind of participate in and also the importance of cultural heritage and preservation? Well, the MAOP is a is another program that was established by one of my colleagues in the center, and I tend to do their photography for those events. So a lot of the times, while I have the capabilities of academic writing and editing, which is something I I usually end up doing for a lot of my colleagues here because I'm, mm. I'm a native English speaker, but I tend to do a lot of photography okay. because I'm a, I'm a, I'm relatively talented when it comes to photography and I know metadata tagging as well. Mm. So what I do is I go and I take photos of these events. I do, I research metadata tags that will be effective for disseminating it over Google and I edit them, post them on my blog or I send them to whichever organizer and I help to push that into the public. So that's mainly what I am able to do because I have a background in social media management, working in the tourism industry. I'm pretty decent at getting the word out. Yeah. And also yeah. not only getting the word out, but creating engaging content that makes people want to know more. Like mm. I got a pretty sweet picture behind me, right? Yes. Doesn't that look awesome? It right, does. exactly. So 
I would like to say I'm using my marketing skills in, in archaeology. Mm. Like, you're great at hyping me for an introduction. <laughs> I'm good at hyping Rex. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So, um, so you kind of on Twitter, you describe yourself as Little promoting Twitter. secular education, uh, yes. preservation efforts, and good tr trouble against the patriarchy. I mean, yes, how does then? How do you use your role, especially in somewhere like Egypt, to kind of combat some of those things? Well, the big problem I see in, in a country like Egypt is these the students are not taught critical thinking mm. whatsoever. They're taught what to think, okay. not how to think. Yeah. Because unfortunately, in a lot of places where you have deep religious indoctrination, they're just told to accept things as truth. Mm. Whatever. I'm not here to debate anybody's religion. I'm here to talk about how asking questions is an effective manner to become a better researcher. How, what, where, why, mm. to what extent. These are questions that are not asked by many students because they've never been taught to ask this. Because if you start asking these questions, you probably are not going to continue <laughs> believing what you've been told. Yeah. So when you see places like Egypt, where you have extremely high rates of illiteracy, extremely high rates of domestic violence against women, and if I'm not mistaken, one of the lowest levels of scientific literacy in the world, you'll see a society that is not necessarily moving ahead that is struggling with itself mm. the same can be said of my own country right now though we've systematically gutted education for the last 30 years and uh well i think we elected trump a couple years ago right i, I would say that's a <laughs> i would say that's a pretty direct relation to education yeah. <laughs> so in general when you when you instill in people this notion of asking questions i.e the socratic theory mm. the socratic mm. method of questioning you can come up with better answers to these problems. You, you're better equipped to handle these questions that people have. So what I encourage people is just to ask questions. Mm. Continue asking questions. Don't accept what someone says is truth unless you can prove it. So that's mainly when I say I'm promoting secular education, it's separating the religious mentality of not asking and accepting I'm saying, yeah. no, you need to look at the references. You need to look at peer reviewed. You need to ask questions. Why is it presented this way? Who is benefiting from this? A, mm. quick, a quick economic method is always asking, where does the dollar go? Who's yeah. making the money? If of you want to know who's pushing something, who benefits? Yeah. So I, I'm working with a student right now who potentially has a full scholarship to Southampton. And through all of our efforts working on her papers, it's always me saying, we must think, mm. we must think, ask questions, keep asking questions. So here where I am, very few people ask questions. Like I have, yeah. I have colleagues that tell me they're going to find Noah's Ark. I'm like, oh yeah? Did you look at the record of the, to find any universal flood? It's not in the, it's not in the geological record. There's no, no, no evidence of that. And they're like, I'm a fine Noah. And I'm like, Good luck. Bonne chance, yeah. mon ami. Like, I have people all the time that tell me that they're going to go go to the exact spot where Moses crossed the Red wow. Sea. I'm like, ah, yeah, that's where we're going to go. And then I find out there are other pseudo-archaeologists who are capitalizing off of the, I call them like Old Testament tours. Yeah. Where, yeah. granted, I mean, you can go to the Sinai. The Sinai is absolutely amazing. Mm. It's, it's one of my favorite places in Egypt. And you can go to the places where all of these events allegedly happened. But at the same time, people are capitalizing off of this. People are yeah. making a lot of money on mm. this. So it leads me to get the question of, is there any authenticity behind this? Or are you guys just capitalizing off of people's beliefs? Like, If I'm not mistaken, if you want to go to Mecca, as is required for the Muslim population, mm. they just raise the visas. Yeah. I'm like, that's a, oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, man, y'all make it so much money. How many people? Oh, great money making. You get the oil and the religion. <laughs> so this is it, is me just at, tell, encouraging people to ask critical questions. You don't need to be mm. mean. You don't need to be to belittle people's beliefs or anything. You just ask the question. So that's my main approach with a lot of students is ask questions. Mm. No, definitely. Yeah. And I find it amazing as well that, um, especially in the Middle East, where there is a 
large disparity, much larger than I guess you could say in the West, between men and women, that then you're able to then use your career and your kind of position to also yes. then promote education and opportunities yes. for for women. women. Yes, very much so. I am, while I'm most certainly uh, somebody who enjoys helping men as well, trust me, mm. I'm not going to turn you down because <laughs> of your gender, but I am most certainly someone here that when I see women being pushed down mm. and regularly abused, I'm the one that's telling them like, we're going to work on your English we're going to help you get a job. We're mm. going to make sure that your family can't abuse you anymore. Like I am very, very much outspoken about the importance of financial independence for women. Yeah. And this is a country that does not want their women to work, unfortunately. It's getting better and better. Yeah. But most of the time, for example, in Egypt, the population in the last 170 days went up 750,000. Gosh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, they're, they are, they're in a country of 107 million, they're projected to double their population in the next 20 years. In a wow. country that's already overpopulated, yeah. does not have the infrastructure to facilitate this, mm. and is politically unstable. Yeah. And as a result of the lack of sex education, the cultural shame towards sexuality, these women are told they're going to be happy and free yeah. when they get married, and that's not the case. So it's, it's very difficult because the women here are very tough. Yeah, they are yeah. dedicated and they are loving and they love their family. They're wonderful people. They just need to be given a chance. Mm. But at the same time, a lot of the people in power are men and they are, yeah, they are yeah. very abusive. I have seen, I have witnessed terrible behavior from people in authoritative positions to which in, in the West, they would never mm. have a career afterwards. Yeah, but because yeah, yeah. of where they are, they're the ones in charge. It's quite funny, actually. I'm like, oh, yeah? Ah, I see why you're here. Okay. Mm. No, that's incredible. Um, it's it's I mean, sad. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, how, um, how welcoming are they to kind of some of these changes? I mean, are you finding over the years that there is sort of a changing scene or, or do they still push yeah. back? Yeah, Egypt, I, so I... I see it. I've been here three years. Yeah. And you, the Middle East is like an onion. Okay. <laughs> Every layer you peel back, there's a, there's like 20 other layers. And to yeah. be honest, from the West, we tend to get a Eurocentric education. Yeah. So we don't necessarily understand all of the complexities that have been going on since far before even the Ottoman Empire in this mm. area. So you're dealing with so many levels of politics and religion and culture that are all more together. Yeah. So I would say you do have people that want change, but at the same time, Egypt has experienced massive brain drain because the best and most talented people, they escape. So you're in a country where the best and brightest want to leave mm. and foundations are having trouble providing scholarships to students and getting them to want to come back because they don't want to deal with abusive people in places of power. They don't want to deal with the, the, the government treating them how they're treated. They don't want to deal with being harassed in the streets every day. Like I walk around with a weapon in my hand in <laughs> Egypt. I'm six feet tall. I'm like, I'm ready to mess you up. But yeah. like, this is the reality mm. and i i was somewhere yesterday and i saw a woman start crying because somebody harassed her in the streets and these women they're, they're they haven't been taught to yell back mm. this is it is like the women they're they're shamed to just accept it that it's their fault yeah that that they are responsible for all the ill that happens to them and i i see it constantly so when i say that i see change i see it in the youth I yeah. see it with my I see it with my friends that have taken off their hijab. I have five different friends since I've been here that have taken off their hijab. Wow. I see the young girls starting to learn to skate, like skateboard and yeah. roller skating. Yeah. Alexandria has a big has a big skate community. Who would have mm. thought? It's great. I'm like a little Tony Hawk going on over here. <laughs> so I see it in the youth, and I see the crop tops coming. But also, wow. Egypt is a country where you have immense separation of the classes. The wealthy live behind walls here. They're usually yeah, not yeah. interacting with the poor, unfortunately. So if you're wealthy and you're living behind walls in one of these nice compounds, you can wear your tank top. Mm. You don't have to worry that a man in the street is going to call you a terrible word or grab you. Yeah. So this is a country where 
certain places are more progressive than others. But at the same time, the progressive people have very little desire to interact with the majority of people. So you have a select group of people who are trying to push progress, but it's not necessarily happening to everyone. But at the same time, I do believe that whereas Gutenberg's printing press hit Europe like a lightning bolt and started the Reformation, yeah. The internet has done the same for the Middle East. Wow. You can see yeah. you can see the Arab Spring simply would not have happened mm. without the internet. And it's also why you see the internet limited and shut down in a lot of these of course, places. Of course. Yeah. So yeah. the internet's been around what like 25 years maybe, mm. maybe 30, maybe 30 if you've been yeah. proactive. Yeah. And Egypt is a country that you have a lot of new ideas that have been able to come in. But at the same time, because of the political situation, the best and brightest have gone to different countries in search of opportunities and freedom. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a very difficult situation in this country. And I wholeheartedly believe these people deserve much better than what they currently have. But mm. the situation is what it is. Yeah. I just try to do my best to, to help those that I can help. Mm. And that's no, through course. education and teaching English and bringing girls, bringing girls on scuba diving trips, teaching them to swim, really just anything that I can do to, to, to help, to support, to support women getting forward. Because mm. these women, they're often abused by their families too. They're often yeah. abused by their partners or they go out the street and they're abused. And mm. you can see it. Like one of the saddest things I ever learned was I was looking at it. I was, I was talking with a friend about a niqab, which is the, um, the very, the full, full face covering that yes. you see. And I was like, wow, that's sad. And my friend told me, she's like, Alicia, they don't wear it because they have to. Mm. They wear it because it's easier to hide than to deal with the harassment. I see. And that's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's heartbreaking definitely. Because in the West, we, we look at that, we just think it's, we just think that like it's forced. It's not necessarily forced in Egypt. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of social pressure, mm. but these women are harassed every single day. And what's worse is the men, if I talk with many of the men, most of the, at this point in time, they're, start, they're starting to listen. They're like, no, Alicia, it's like this everywhere. I'm like, no, dear, it's not. <laughs> yeah. no, I no, I don't walk outside anywhere with a giant stabber in my hand, worried I'm going to have to stab someone who tries to grab me. Only country I've had to do that. I've lived in, I've been to 35 plus different countries. I've lived in at least a dozen. This is the first country that I have to walk around with something like a chain in my hand because I try, because men here, statistically, they harass women because it's fun. This is the overarching right. reason. They're bored. It's Gosh. fun. They get a reaction. So I try and make myself look as unfun as possible to yeah. bother. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's my survival in Egypt. Dark sunglasses and a weapon. Wow. I mean... So it seems like, though, that the environment and the atmosphere of Egypt very much so plays into all of the things that kind of all of your passions and everything. Do you yeah. see yourself then staying there for a while? Economically, I'm doing pretty OK over here while yeah. the world falls <laughs> apart. The Egyptian <laughs> currency is plummeting. I'm like, well, my money's in the US dollar and that's doing OK over yeah. here. But to be honest, I mean, I think I, my neighbor and I were talking. He's, he, he's a doctor in America. He's like, which which country do you think is going to pop off first? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. It's a good question. Is it going to be America or Egypt? I don't know. So I guess I would like to keep my work here in the future. Mm. But in general, the, the, the limitations of the Internet make my work almost undoable because I love to do videography, but yeah. I just with the limitation of 300 gigs a month for my for my internet. That's my uh, quota. 300 course. gigs. Saw, I can't even play, I can't even play PlayStation anymore. I'm like, well, we're playing <laughs> one player campaign on Borderlands. I guess no friends, but I can't I can't do a lot of my work because I mm. have such limitations. I mean, I'm having a, a, a fight with with my telecommunications almost every week. It's just yeah. the day to day struggle of Egypt makes it very difficult but at the same time i mean i've got the pyramids two hours from me i have mm. some of the world's best scuba diving so it's 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 a wonderful country but the day-to-day -day life is extremely difficult i hope yeah. to see it improve yeah. but i would like to think i will pursue my phd and mm -hmm. maybe possibly in europe mm. but try and keep a lot of my work here in egypt yeah. because i do i love the country i love the people i love the history mm. and i'd like to continue working here but unfortunately there are a lot of limitations and i mean for example one of the expeditions i was on recently 
the government seized all the stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah, they took the scuba scooters. No scuba scooter. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, you're like, well, is anyone arrested in jail? No? All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, the Middle East is definitely a crazy place. I, I've lived in Bahrain, Qatar, and my family still lives there. And um, it's it's a strange thing because despite all of its downfalls, it, there is a, a certain charm to it, I find. Oh, yes, but those places, dear, have obscene amounts of money. They do, they do. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Egypt, you have a, you, Egypt has, unfortunately, a very high level of poverty. Yeah. So I think while you still might have the conservative behavior in mm. those countries, a lot of the problems in Egypt aren't necessarily stemming from conservative yeah. beliefs. It's it's stemming from poverty. Mm. So I would love to go visit Bahrain and Qatar. If I'm not mistaken, I flew through Qatar, and I think it has one of the world's only five-star airports. I flew through oh. Qatar. Yeah, it's Doha. very nice. It is oh, a very yeah, nice. Yeah, it's a very nice. Area. I was uh, my first introduction to the Middle East. I was like, ah, oh, I see what you're doing with the oil money. Yeah. Mm, very nice job over here. But Egypt, you you land in Egypt. You just smell the cigarettes. You get off yeah. the plane, it's just cigarettes everywhere. I'm like, ah, very different culture. So, I mean, it, while the Middle East is most certainly a crazy place, it is developing very, mm. developing and modernizing very quickly. For example, Saudi Arabia is on its 2030 initiative to modernize, and they yes. are arguably the leaders, one of the leaders of the Islamic world. Mm. So if you have one of the leaders pushing forward to modernize and reform, the others will hopefully follow suit. Yeah. So I'd like to say... Unfortunately, climate change is a reality. While I'm being optimistic, I'm like, it's going to improve. I'm like, yeah, the water wars. Good luck. <laughs> so I'm hoping for the best in these areas, but they are trying to take methods to push themselves forward and to modernize. But there's a lot of conflicting events that are outside of their control that they're going to have to deal with. I mean, yeah, for example, yeah. Pakistan right now is a third or a quarter of it is underwater and 20 million people have been made homeless by this. Yeah. It's it, that's terrible. That's a that's a developing country that just got mm. smacked across the face. And I do worry that with climate change getting worse and worse, and well, we've done nothing about it for forty years. Great job, guys. It's we're going to see more and more climate disasters in places that are developing and at risk. Mm. So that's that's the double sided sword. There is yeah. they're pushing yeah. for progress, but it's at a very difficult time. Mm. No. no, no. Definitely. So, so just um, lastly, going back to, I guess, the first half of, of the uh, podcast, what advice would you give someone wanting to become a maritime archaeologist? Don't listen to anyone around you telling you you're just going to be an underwater basket weaver. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if that's what you really want to do, make it your dream. Yeah. And love yeah. it and live it. And don't listen to people around you who will put you down because I'm a person who has always had my love of history degraded by my family around me because they didn't see the value in it. But then again, my no one from my family went to college. I'm mm. the first, I'm the first one that's really going into this field. So I would say don't listen to the naysayers who might not understand your passion. I would say invest in yourself. I, that's probably the best advice I can give, especially mm. to women, is invest in yourself, invest in your skills, invest in, in advancing your comprehension of English, invest in diving, invest in camera equipment, invest in traveling, invest in yourself. Mm. Because at the end of the day, no one but you cares about your dreams. Yeah. So yeah. if this is truly what you want to do, push yourself and do not feel pulled down by anybody else because you are the one that is going to determine your strength and your passions in the field. And that alone will speak for you because I've been here for three years and let's just say I, I wasn't necessarily accepted when I first came mm. and uh, I've gotten to a point where my work speaks for myself. Brilliant. I, I just, I, I absolutely love how much your passion and just love for diving and history shines through i love it but, uh, <laughs> thank you ever so much uh, well, thank, you. thank you ever so much for what has been a really really interesting podcast i think yeah um, and uh i appreciate you having me on here yeah no well thank you very much so that is um 
all for today. Thank you very much. And uh, to anyone watching, which hopefully there'll be a fair few, um, go and see our other videos, our previous interviews, and we've got some really brilliant ones coming up soon as well. So there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. I hope you have a wonderful day. And thanks so much for having me on the Daily Medieval Podcast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>